Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. Rob Kramer here with you. And before we go to Dr. Peter Bogosian, he's at the philosophy department at Portland State University. I want to wrap up one of the callers who's been holding on through the break, wants to talk about uh, President Obama. Dave in Milwaukee, thanks for hanging on. You with me, Dave? Hello. Hi, you're on. Jeff, yes. Sorry, first time caller, kind of nervous. Oh, no problem. (laughs) Well, I'm going to go on an earlier break. I heard a quote from Mr. Obama. Um... America can do whatever they set their mind to. Well, the way things are going in this country, I feel he didn't finish that statement by saying, as long as you do as I say. (laughs) I get that. It does seem to be that's uh, what the finish of that sentence is in his mind, doesn't it? Thanks for calling with that. Let's go out to Dr. Peter Rogozin. Peter, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Rob. Hey, you bet. Uh, So I saw you on, uh, well, last week, on Thursday, I lectured to... Dr. Bogosian's class, his education philosophy class, and you told me the story, and I thought it was just so uh, gripping that I wanted to get you on to talk about what's happening with you right now. Yeah, I'm still incredulous myself. Well, so let me set it up. You're going to give a speech, a public address at PSU this Friday, and it's titled, Jesus, the Easter Bunny, and Other Delusions, Just Say No. That's correct. Okay, now, obviously, it's a provocative title, Mm -hmm. right? Because you're going to talk about... Yeah. Your viewpoint that, you know, religious reasoning, religious-based reasoning is not uh, a superior way to look at the world and that kind of thing. That would be a charitable interpretation of what I'm going to do, but yeah. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, so you told me that when this started to kind of get in the bloodstream at PSU, there were complaints from the faculty about this title of this speech. All right. And it was the conservatives who were defending you, and especially religious conservatives who were defending you and who were polite with you and who were, you know, saying, trying to engage you and maybe change your mind about your viewpoint, but it was the left who was attacking you. Fascinating, isn't it? Absolutely fascinating. So I want to be crystal clear about something. Religious people and people of faith have been nothing but kind to me throughout all my talks and even my career. They they pray for me. They bake me cookies. I'm on a low-carb diet, so I don't, I don't eat them, but they invite me out and my family to, to their church mm-hmm. or to their homes or to restaurants. It's the secular left who's really calling for my head on a stick. <laughs> and they have, they've asked me not to speak. Uh, they've given me an incredible amount of grief about the talk. And there was even a complaint to uh, the, president the president of the university. Yeah, and it's interesting. You know, when I was on hold and I was listening to the um, – you're, you're running, it said, they think that this radio is hate speech. Uh-huh. And I think that that's how people on the left are trying to characterize what I'm doing. They're trying to characterize it as hate speech. Right. And so they, I think one of the problems is that, they, that the left thinks that ideas demand dignity and respect. Mm-hmm. Ideas don't demand people require dignity and require respect. Mm-hmm. And a criticism of fascism or communism is not a criticism of a person. It's a criticism of an ideology. Mm-hmm. And I think part of – I think this is a very complicated problem, but the irony should not be lost on anyone, including your listeners, is that you and the right have rallied to my defense for academic freedom and for my freedom of speech. Mm-hmm. And, and oddly enough, virtually every, if not every, person of faith has, has also done so. Interesting. Fascinating. So I saw the complaint that was filed, the letter written by a faculty member to Vim Vivel, the uh, president of, of uh, PSU. Right. And I just had to laugh when <laughs> he did what, you know, what the, the person in his position will do. He right. kicked it downstairs to an administrative person to handle the process of the complaint, right? right? And that person is their quote. And I'm not making this up, people. I am not making this up. This is written from the hands of the president of PSU. Quote, the chief diversity officer right. of Portland State <laughs> University. Right. Well, you know what? As a taxpayer, I can rest easy at night knowing <laughs> that Portland State University right. has a person who is in charge of being the chief diversity right. officer. What on earth? And, and I think part of the problem is that my, my attacks have been on this notion of diversity, multiculturalism, egalitarianism. Diversity itself is an ideology. Right. Multiculturalism. There's no. There are no. There's no evidence for this. And so the the problem with these ideologies 
come when when people tend to think that the that the ideologies that they have and the things that they believe are universally true and everyone should believe in this kind of a cultural myopia. Mm-hmm. You know, you, we, we give higher confidence values to these things, which really are ideologies. And when you call people out on that, one of the reasons that they get, they get mad about this is because they don't have any evidence for it. Right. And they don't consider it to be an ideology. They think it's basically uh, kind of self-evidently true, right? That's exactly correct. And, yeah. and the difference, so, so people of faith and I have genuine and profound disagreements about the nature of reality. Yes. But I don't think that they're bad people. Right. And I, and I would hope that they don't think that I'm a bad person. Well, it seems obvious by the way they treat you that they don't. Y- yeah, it's, it, and that's part of the interesting, interesting point is we each think that the other person has misconstrued reality and in a profound way. Yes. But in the case with secular liberals, they don't think that I'm misconstrued reality. They think that I'm a bad person promoting hate speech or mm-hmm. lack of diversity. And what I'm doing is there's something intrinsic to what I'm doing that's, that's just wrong. Mm-hmm. But instead of you know, challenging me to a debate or you know, wanting to expose these things to the marketplace of ideas, they try to shut down the talk. Interesting. And so are they going to be successful, or how are they going about trying to shut down your talk? Well, they file complaints to the administration. Mm -hmm. I assume I'm being investigated by the diversity board. I don't even know what that means, the diversity. I don't know what sort of (laughs) metric or how you would adjudicate a a complaint from saying you're not diverse enough. (laughs) Right. And I've had people come up to me and tell me, people. I don't even know these people, in no uncertain terms, you know, don't do this. This is promoting a bad atmosphere. Yes. You know, if we go, you know, Nash, PSU is going to get bad press. They're going to think that, you know. But again, it's, I I think that the way that they have treated me throughout this whole thing, and, and not the people I know personally because they know me, but I'm really genuinely surprised at the reaction to this. The complaint filed by the faculty members said that the PSU mission statement calls for a, quote, climate of mutual respect and reflection that supports different beliefs and points of view right. and the open exchange of ideas. Okay? Right. And so this person objected to the title and who knows what, what's in the speech, but the title especially because it was kind of mocking in its tone right. and dismissive in its tone of uh, religious beliefs, Right. right. All right, faith-based uh, beliefs. Yeah. And so is your response to that well, that you're not mocking a person, you're mocking an idea? Yeah, and ideas can be mocked. That, that's one of my responses. The other response is that this is a free speech issue. Mm-hmm. And the, the final response is, it's funny that many secular liberals, they, they, they certainly save their vituperation for me, but their protestations of tolerance – don't they're they're very they're disingenuous they're just not genuine and so i've never thought that tolerance should be a virtue yes um take it for example the 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 taliban you know why why should we be tolerant of misogynal misogynistic delusional cavemen i mean we shouldn't Mm -hmm. there are many things that we ought not many practices that we shouldn't be tolerant of but the one of the ironies is that the very people who profess tolerance really are the least tolerant people around. Well, and I've always thought that, I mean, the whole ethic of tolerance is self-refuting anyway, because if if you are intolerant of intolerance, exactly. you are being intolerant, right? That's exactly I correct. Mean, so it is self-refuting as right. an ideology, and that's why they get themselves kind of wrapped around an axle with things like what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. and I've never believed, I believe that, so, so here's here's really part of the problem. So not only is this idea of tolerance really at the core of the secular liberal ideology, yes. I don't think we should be teaching tolerance. Mm-hmm. I think we should not be teaching. What we're currently teaching is we teach students to withhold judgments and all cultures are equal and all people. That's obviously nonsense. That's not even nonsense. That's asinine. Mm-hmm. What we should be doing is we should be teaching students how to make better, more discerning judgments. And I think that way of conceptualizing the problem at a fundamental level itself is where the the difference comes between this, my secular colleagues and myself. Yeah, interesting. Uh, Pete, can you hang on through sure. the break and we can sure. take some phone calls on the other yeah. side? Because I would like to also drill down not just on this topic of the secular left being intolerant of views, but also I'd like to drill down a little bit on the the viewpoint you're going to be talking about Friday night sure, of you uh, your 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 uh, critique of religious based reasoning. You bet, my pleasure. 503-417-9595, that's our local phone number. If you have a question for Dr. Bogosian, you can also get us toll-free at 877-866-HEY-LARS, uh, 
Four three nine five two seven seven. I'm Rob Kramer. You've got the Lars Larson Show. Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. Rob Kramer filling in for Lars today and tomorrow. Lars is making his way back from Israel, where he spent last week. On the phone with me is Dr. Peter Bogosian. He's a philosophy professor at Portland State University, and he is under attack from the secular left, the tolerant left, because of some of his views that he will be talking about on Friday in a public speech that he's making. And guess who's defending him? Well, of course, the conservatives, especially the religious conservatives, even though the views that he'll be talking about on Friday night directly challenge the legitimacy of the religious worldview. But yet it's the it's the conservative and especially the religious conservatives who are defending Dr. Bogosian's right for free speech. Uh, Peter, let's go to the phones because we have a lot of people that really are interested in talking with you about this. Sure, I'd be happy to. First, let's go to Dennis in McMinnville. Dennis, you're on with Dr. Peter Bogosian. Hi, I'm, uh, I was surprised. He's a, uh, he's a little on the liberal side for me. I'm to the right of Ann Coulter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that he understood, basically, what he said was, and I've never heard anybody phrase it like this, is that the way you can identify a real liberal in many ways is they always take it personal. A conservative always takes it on an issue. Mm-hmm. And uh, if I could expand on the reason I called, I'd like to ask him two questions. Sure. What is your source of rights politically, and what is your source of moral absolutes? Um, so what is my source of rights and moral absolutes? Yeah, where do you get, what, 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 where do you get them from? Okay, a uh, couple of things. I, I want to, if I may, comment on what you said first about being a liberal. I, I am actually not a liberal, and I'm not a conservative uh, of course, to the people around PSU, I'm probably some hyper-conservative. But I voted, the last election I voted for Obama. I have some very conservative views, and I have some very liberal views. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to make that clear that Rob hasn't found some conservative guy, got him on his show, and then, you know, I'm not trumpeting the banner of, of, of conservatism by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, so right. I just want to be crystal clear about that. Alrighty. So uh, as to your other two questions, they're more complicated but I can give you sources and ways to conceptualize this problem that may be helpful to you. I like John Rawls when it comes to rights. I believe that we can rationally figure out um, what our rights can be in a society and what forms of governance that we ought to have. And I've been recently reading and quite into Sam Harris in The Moral Landscape when he talks about uh, certain ways that science can inform us and, and ways that we can make better decisions. And, and also, if you, you come to the talk, Dennis, I'm going to get into that as well. Hmm, okay. but the bottom line to that is uh, I'd suggest that you look at uh, John Rawls, The Theory of Justice, and Sam Harris, The Moral Landscape, and those comport with my views. Okay. The, uh, the, the foundation would be that you're an evolutionist and that you don't like the fact that there's a creator, and therefore uh, you don't want a uh, responsibility to a creator or to a god. So that would, by, by assuming the position of... I'm, a, I'm a guessing you're an evolutionist, that that would be the reason why you would do that. And that's understandable. I understand that fully, why they do that, to uh, to get away from an obligation to a creator who makes rules before I'm obligated to those rules. But uh, And I understand that, but I was just curious on your your answer for that. Yeah, well, uh, you know, you said you don't like the fact that there's a creator... No, I said that you do. You don't like the fact that there's no, a creator. Right. Yeah, I'm saying that you said that I don't like the fact that there's a creator, and I, I don't. What evidence do you have for the fact that there's a creator? Uh, by the design. That's what I'm saying. If you're going to go into uh, this this conversation or this time frame, is not going to allow. But just the fact that there's intelligent design, that it requires an intelligence. Yeah, you know, we're not going to go down that path, Dennis. It is a fascinating topic, but it, we just don't have the time to go exploring down that uh, that particular thread. But I want to thank you for calling, and let's go out to Rachel in Portland. Rachel, you're on the Lars Larson Show. Hello, Professor, Doctor. This is Rachel. I'm your student this term, and oh. I really am enjoying your class. Oh, thanks. Extra credit. <laughs> hey, you always say that, but we know we don't get it. We have to work hard Well, thanks. Um First of all, I am. I shared with you in class when Rob was there that I am a God-fearing Christian. Right. Um, I have been since I've been eight years old. Well, that I wasn't a woman then, but I am now. And um, so, with regards to the issue of Jesus and, and and putting him in the same thing as the bunny rabbit and so forth, I would argue that I do have evidence, and that's how I base my faith. But um, before I even had that, uh, 
my faith was based on the fact of what the gentleman said before, um, and also my upbringing, but I wanted to find out for myself. And there are two, uh, one very significant and incredible source. I know that you referenced Rawls and Harris, but Josh McDowell, uh, Josh is www. Yeah, I've, I've read most of Josh McDowell's works. Right, and so there is evidence that substantiates that Jesus uh, is the Son of God, that he did live amongst us, that he is who he says that he is. So when when you argue that there isn't, or that you feel that there isn't, that's just not true. There is evidence. Um, with regards to what's happening to you at the university, I find it absolutely outrageous. Um, this is the same thing that happened to Dr. La Riviere uh, at U of O, where my daughter attends. Uh, and what it is, I believe it's much deeper than just an ideologue with regards to what your topic is, which I'm going to come and I can't wait. But the thing is, is that it is about a Democrat ideology and that when somebody gets too far outside of that realm uh, that's going to cost the party, that is where this type of stuff comes into play. Now we see uh, down at U of O that uh, Chip or um, Kelly is, or I'm sorry, Kelly is going to be leaving the University of Oregon. No, nope, actually, the new news cycle, he has decided to stay, Rachel. So it's... Well, the, uh, that's good, because then that means to me that the governor is coming to his senses and there's going to be a reinstatement of La Riviere. When you have professors like Dr. Um, Born, uh, Bogosian uh, and Dr. La Riviere or people in that uh, sort of mindset, I, I don't want them going away. I, I agree with you there. Rachel, I'm going to have to cut you off right let there. Me finish, let me finish, Rob. No, yeah, we're, we're right up against the break. I'm sorry, Rachel. And we, we have a hard break down at the bottom of the hour. Uh, Pete, can you stay with us, though? You, you bet. Sure. we got more phone calls on the other side. I'm Rob Kramer. You've got the Lars Larson Show. Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. Rob Kramer with you talking about, well, religion. Religion at Portland State University, or I should say faith. A lot of you have questions for Dr. Peter Bergosian. I'm going to bring him back on the line, and we're going to go straight to your phone calls. 503-417-9595, that's our local phone number. Toll-free number is 866-439-5277. Because a lot of you want to talk with Dr. Bergosian, I'm going to go straight out to the phones. Who is the next person in line? Looks like Stephen, calling from Boston, listening over the Internet. Stephen, thanks for calling the Lars Larson Show. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Great. Uh, listen, I just wanted to uh, give a props to uh, Gojian. Uh, you know, I was a, a university lecturer myself for some years, mm -hmm. and uh, all the frustrations that he's expressing are ones that, you know, he's not alone. Uh, I had the same. You know, really it comes down to uh, putting facts uh, before everything else and um, not just going by ideology, the, the hypocrisy he was talking about before, uh, runs rampant in the academy, and uh, you know I think he's really to be congratulated on what he's doing. You know, really the ideology of the far left that's in the academy right now yeah. is basically stems from the exact same place as the far right conservative ideology or the religious ideology that mm -hmm. we're talking about, mm -hmm. and it all has to do with putting the conclusion first and trying to work backwards to the premises rather than following a logical set of questions and seeing what you know, comes forth from there. So uh, I just wanted to show support because uh, this is a voice that is needed in the academy right now. Thanks, Stephen. I, I really appreciate it. And what you described is absolutely one of the key things. It's called confirmation bias. And people start with their beliefs first, and then they look. The previous caller talked about Josh McDowell. It, and I'll go into more, more detail in the talk at 27 at 7 p.m. at Hoffman Hall. But so many people do that if they want to find out if their book is true or inerrant or their prophecies. They look to conclusions that support that as opposed to looking to conclusions or looking to texts that support that, looking to what other people having, have to say about those texts, and then looking again at what the initial responder like Josh McDowell is. And so we're all, we can become engaged in this conversation of ideas and understand that. But that won't happen as long as people are there to shut down the discourse. So I really genuinely appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Stephen, thanks for calling. We'll go to, looks like Gil in Portland. Gil, thanks for calling the Lars Larson Show. Hello there. I just wanted to say that um, I'm a supporter of Dr. Bogosian, although I might be also considered a bit of a gadfly. But as a student of his at one time, uh, he's really helped to inform how I approach what he's saying here. Um, and I just basically wanted to ask him about his 
cognitive sickness construct, what he exactly means by that. So the cognitive sickness idea that, and what he's referring to, Rob, was a previous talk that I gave in which I said that faith is a cognitive sickness. And thanks for your kind words, Gil. What I mean by what I mean by that is that it is faith is a type of toxin that prevents one from thinking critically and clearly. It clouds one's judgment because it's a process that one uses that won't enable one to reach a reliable conclusion. But yet, the reason that that alone wouldn't make it toxic, but because the process itself is so profoundly lodged in the cognitive mechanism. I mean, Shermer talks about this idea of the brain as an engine of belief, that the process of faith itself is difficult to dislodge, particularly when it's reinforced by elements in the culture and elements in family and society. Sure. And uh, so, Dr. Bergosian, if the question, though, was, is there any evidence to support that uh, faith-based orientation or spiritual orientations can promote mental health and specifically cognitive and even neuronal decline, yeah. uh, as well as longevity, would you say what to that supposition? Here's what I would say, and this is inevitable in these sorts of conversations. The conversations invariably, and I've done this almost, well, actually probably every day of my life, multiple conversations for over 20 years, 30,000 students, and the move that you just made is the inevitable trajectory that these conversations follow. The conversations will start with, my faith is true. And once people realize that they can't defend that any longer, almost invisibly, the conversation shifts. When I say invisibly, people won't acknowledge the fact that their faith isn't true, and that, that is that it doesn't kind of latch on to reality. And then they'll say, well, it's beneficial. My faith is benef- it's beneficial to people. Mm-hmm. That is an illegitimate move because it doesn't answer the initial question. But how about if somebody, if I want to jump in here, how about if somebody said, well, I don't really care if my faith is true or not, but it is beneficial. Okay, oh, okay. and Daniel Dennett is somewhat sympathetic to that. The problem with that is that people who have these orientations, and, and uh, like one of the callers, I think it was Dennis, people who have these orientations, these things bleed through the, to the public policy arena. And that's the problem. People stop making decisions on the basis of evidence and use their faith-based beliefs to guide public policy. Fair enough, but there could be evidence that faith-based beliefs are beneficial to a body politic, right? I mean... And therefore, that evidence could be enough to actually put some type of faith-based public policy in place. Okay, well, then you'll have to go back. What, what exactly do you mean? Evidence that uh, – so is there ev- – Gill's question was evidence for an individual, like people who have high church – I think he's talking about the Murphy study. Gill, you're talking about the Murphy study? Oh, you know, I, I cut him off because I was ready to go to another caller, and we want to get through the calls here. But I'm saying, okay, to the uh, extent that faith and religious communities bring people together, people yeah. of a common viewpoint – that they have a uh, a set of moral values that become important to them, they try to live their lives by, and lacking some kind of faith-based uh, mechanism, that wouldn't come about. I mean, I could go down lots of different paths and say yeah. these are things that could conceivably uh, be positive effects of a faith-based lifestyle, right? And then we could test those to see if actually I mean, they are more true than the, you know... One could say the same thing about North Korea. I mean, one could say the same thing about Nazism or any ideology. Well, no, you could. Then you'd have to test that to see if it's true. That's what I'm saying. But if my premise was not that my religion's true, but that this religious belief or a faith-based life is beneficial to society. And that is exactly something that I'm going to go over in my talk. Cool. Exactly. Great. Let's go to another caller, Ben, in Portland. You're on with Dr. Peter Bogosian. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I had a uh, just a, one quick comment for uh, Dr. Bogosian. Um, it's, it's just a 30-minute argument for uh, design, if that's okay. Can I throw that in there real quick? 30-minute? <laughs> 30, 30 seconds. Okay, 30 yeah, seconds. that'd yeah. be better. 30-second. <laughs> um, okay, so let, let me just set it up this way. I work at uh, UPS here in Portland, and um, our building is a building that has a lot of complexity to it. It's a building where there are all these belts that send packages to different areas, and there's electricity and plumbing and, and all this um, different stuff to the building. You're 20 seconds already. Okay. <laughs> why Why is it, um, I mean, you wouldn't question that that building was built by somebody because you see the complexity and 
intricacy of it, you wouldn't say that that came about on its own, right? So are you then going to make an analogy to the universe and the world and say that I I, I am, and, and simply saying that that building can't reproduce itself, it can't heal itself like the human body can, so why is it ridiculous to think that there's a designer for us when you wouldn't question that there'd be a designer for that specific building? Uh, uh, well, I could talk about that all day, but what makes you think that the argument from a building and the argument for the universe are analogous? I mean, wh why would you even think that in the first place? Because you see complexity in, in both, and I think anyone, when they walked by that building, would assume right off the bat that it had a builder, that it had a designer for that building. So why would um, the human body and really the universe that is inf infinitely more complex than that, why would it not be logical to assume there was also a designer to that? Okay, well, you, you, it, there are two ways to look at that. So okay. I was right with you until you said the human body. Why, why did you stick the human body in there? Because that's, that's because quite I, a different – that mechanism can be explained through natural selection. So if I may speculate, I suggest that you threw that in there because you – it's a type of confirmation bias because you started with your belief first and then worked backwards from there. Because if you didn't, I don't think you would have thrown the human body in there. So to look at that – I would suggest looking at the mechanism of that and seeing if the reason that you believe it's the same about the body and the universe are the same. Because if there is, then it's possible, and in fact, I would argue that it's likely that there's a kind of an epistemic problem, a problem with the way that you conceptualize the problem. Now, that doesn't take away from the content of what you just said, because what you just said is a very good and very reasonable argument. But we're going to have to explore that on the other side of this break. Dr. Peter Bogosian from Portland State University, you can stick with us. We've got more phone callers on the other side. I've... You've got the Lars Larson Show. I'm Rob Kramer. Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. Rob Kramer with you, filling in for Lars today and tomorrow while he makes his way back to Portland from the Middle East. On the air with me is Dr. Peter Bogosian, a professor of philosophy at Portland State University, and we are having such an in, just a, a interesting conversation about matters of faith, Dr. Bogosian. There are, I think, uh, every phone line is waiting to talk to you. So, Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I do want to say qu quickly a couple of things. That Again, the talk is January 27th, 7 p.m. in Hoffman Hall, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to stick around after the talk and answer questions that I didn't come to. There will be an extensive Q&A. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in these I can't really give the types of answers and the details that I want, but a lot of this stuff uh, is in a philosophy news podcast, and if people go to philosophynews.com, so I'm right there. You could Google Philosophy News Podcast Bogosian, but yeah. it's a lot of these things are explained in great detail. Yeah, and if we get into a matter on one of the uh, callers that is just better done in the context of your uh, presentation on Friday, we'll just say, okay, we're going to cut it off and we'll just uh, defer this to next Friday. You have to go there, show up, and listen to your talk. Perfect. I, I just want to say one more thing that that's that's really you're, they're so civil your callers are so civil and so respectful and so polite welcome to the land of hate radio <laughs> i appreciate i appreciate everyone who's called in and, and uh, I, I am a firm believer that we can rationally sit down and have honest genuine blunt discussions with each other without name calling or absolutely anger. absolutely well let's go to sue in portland for another one of those types of calls sue thanks for calling the lars larson show Hi, I just had one thing to say. I'm the idea of blanketing saying conservatism or liberalism just is so divisive and so ignorant, actually, because people aren't either totally liberal or all, or all conservative. No, but don't you think, and, Sue, though, just to just to chime in here, that there are two general world views at play that you can pretty much say people stand on one side of the divide or the other, and it has to do with what their view is of the appropriate role of government in a free society. No, I think that what's happening is people are being forced to choose one side or the other, but I'm just encouraging them not to. My faith, for instance, leads me into going further from public policy instead of further toward it. Okay. Fair enough. Because if you truly believe God's in control, then you believe he's in control and you quit your fighting. I guess that's true, I, uh, but you could extend that to almost every facet of your life, like, oh, eating your next meal. Exactly. No, no. 
because that's that's not doing harm. When when we're forcing people to take sides and everything, we're judging. We're we're doing all the things Jesus said not to do. Sue, so can can, can a person be unjust towards themselves? Well, I think can they be unjust toward themselves? Who? Well, well, yeah, I imagine yeah. they can. We can at times not do what's best for ourselves. I'm sure that many times we're not doing the best thing we could do for ourselves, but, you know, that takes a little bit of aging and a little bit of wisdom and, you know, and sometimes just making mistakes and learning. And there's nothing wrong with that either. So so you believe that because of your faith, you've uh, chosen to run away from public policy? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you've chosen to turn your back on public and just let God handle everything? No, no, that's oh. not exactly it. But I'm not willing to spend my life trying to uh, deal with the governments here. Oh, so there's they a non. So many, there's, a, there's another ideological reason that doesn't have to do with faith that you hold that belief. Um, not necessarily, because my faith leads me into good works, and I'm busy doing those. And I think that that's what we're told to do, according to the faith that I have. Hmm. Okay. Right. Thanks. Let's go to the next caller, which is Jeff in Portland, former student of yours. Hi, this is Jeff. Uh, thank you for taking my call, Rob. Yeah. And Dr. Bogosian, uh, I thank you for putting up the intolerant support of the State University. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jeff. I don't know how you do it. What Because what class I, I gave me, up. You had me for what class, Jeff? I had you for uh, the University Studies class last term. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. And... I mean, I don't know how you put up with it because I, I just couldn't any longer and had to leave the university. Oh, really, boy, I'm so sorry yeah. to hear that. I know, I know, and it's an unfortunate thing because the administration down there just, just isn't very good, unfortunately, uh, in my opinion. But could you explain to the listeners about the moral landscape? I know that a previous caller kind of got you onto that, but could you explain that to them? Sure. Uh, the Moral Landscape is Sam Harris's book. It's a it's a really fantastic book. If you haven't had a chance, that I'd highly recommend it. It's uh, just came out. It came out fairly recently. It's fairly inexpensive because it's in paperback now. But the idea in the Moral Landscape, Sam Harris has two, and we use this in the class Jefferson. We spent five weeks on the the book. Sam Harris has two distinct targets in this book. One is the secular. Sec- one is secular liberals or the secular left, and there, there are some differences. And one is the idea of faith. And, Peter, we're going to have to probably uh, uh, defer that to Friday night. Friday night it okay, is, Okay, because we're up against the top of the hour. And if you want to hang on for another segment, we have some other callers that would like to talk to you. Great. Last one. Be great. Okay, sounds good. I'm Rob Kramer. You've got the Lars Larson Show. Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. Rob Kramer here with you. Filming for Lars today. He's on his way back from Israel Headed back to Portland. Takes a couple days to get back here. We're talking with Dr. Peter Bogosian, who's a professor of philosophy at Portland State University, and he agreed to hang on for one more segment because we had a lot of phone calls that wanted to, well, talk with you, Dr. Bogosian. Thanks. I I just wanted to say one thing to, to Jeff, and I hope he's still listening. Listen, Jeff, PSU really is a great place. It has supportive staff, great students, and I, this isn't a line. I'm, I, I'm not saying I don't need any. I have so many people out to get me now. 10, 20 more doesn't make a difference. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm really saying that because it's true. And, Jeff, you had me for class, and you know that I'm very blunt and direct, and I'm a straight shooter. I really hope that you come back and come to my office, Newburger Hall, M Mezzanine 424. We'll talk, and let's see if we can get you in here, because this is a great place. And you can find teachers, you can find professors that you groove with. So please give it a shot. It really is a good place. Okay, let's go out to George in Portland. George, you're on the Lars Larson Show with Dr. Peter Bogosian. Hi, Dr. Bogosian. The problem with natural selection is that it, it, it is also a faith, and it cannot explain the creation of the first human beings. It would have us believe that by way of miracle, a sperm and an egg uh, got together out of the primordial, primordial ooze and created a baby outside of a womb because there were no human beings and grew into a human being without the benefit of any parents to be nurtured and protected. And if you believe in transmutation of species, the same problem that exists for humans exists for chimpanzees, and we have never seen a chimpanzee give birth to a human. I'm speechless, 
at that. I, I'm trying to think of a politic and polite way to say it. That explanation of what you think natural selection was, to say that that is not accurate does not even begin to describe it. It is scientifically illiterate. Have you ever read arguments and articles on the other side explaining what natural selection is? Uh, sure, I have. Like and, what? And, uh, like what? And, and, uh, like what? Well, they, 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 it's basically... Uh, no, have you Give me the name of a title of a book and an author you've read. No, I can't name a book. Okay, I can't so name. before you would articulate... But I've studied, I've, studied, oh, oh. I've, studied, I've studied biology and science in, in college. And, and okay. okay, good. So, and uh, uh, you yeah. still can't account for the creation of the first human being. Tell me, how did the first human being come into existence if, okay. if natural selection We are not even anywhere near close to answering. You and I are not anywhere near close to answering that question. Why don't you do this? I can recommend some. You email me, and I'll recommend some books that you can get started on, on to learn about natural selection that are very basic and very clear, and then we can have a discussion about that. So when you really know, you're making a criticism about something that just isn't – what you think you're criticizing, you're not criticizing. Natural selection doesn't say any of the things that you think that it does. Okay, we're going to leave it at that. Evolution does, however. We're going to leave it at that and go to the next caller, Bob in Roseburg. Bob, thanks for calling Lars Larson Show. Thank you. So what's on your mind? Do I have a doctor now? You do. Uh, you bet. You oh, bet. Okay, doctor. Uh, actually, I'm pretty much in support of all you've said so far. Uh, 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 have you read um, Thank God for Evolution by Michael Dowd? No. Should I? That's, you should. You would really like it. He was a third-generation preacher that married yeah. a scientist. I, I know who he is. I haven't read the book. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a good book. And then there's another book that would be good uh, that I think is in support of what you're talking about, and that's called the Inspiration Principle. You can find it at that inspiration at the inspirationprinciple dot com, or you can Google it, and it'll come up one or two on the uh, Google index. Well, the good the good thing about my my profession is that it dovetails perfectly with what I do in my free time. I <laughs> read about this stuff in my free time as well, and I'm always – I really am – I was telling Rob in the break, I am i don't just give lip service to the idea that I'm willing to change my mind. I really am willing to change my mind. And in my classes, I give people time to – five minutes to air their – voice their superstitions. I had a guy last term who took 45 minutes, and he talked about Jesus for 45 minutes. So if somebody knows something that I don't know, I want to know what that is. And I'd like to invite you to the talk January 27th at Hoffman Hall at 7, and it's completely free. Well, I'm more than 300 miles away. Oh, I'm, and sorry. I <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't make it. If you, or if you ever get down this way, do, I, you probably don't. I mean, you're in class. I'll, I mean, you're, you, you're not out public speaking. You're down in class, right? Most and of the time, Bob. I'm going to cut you off there, and we'll get to the next call, which is Mike in Hillsboro. Mike, you're on the Lars Larson Show. How are you guys doing? Uh, <clears throat> I'm, like, I'm also a graduate of... PSU um, art department um, in sculpture. Congratulations. But anyway, uh, I, I took physical anthropology. I found it a, an interesting class. Uh, I, I didn't really agree with too much of what they had to say. I think the, probably one of the things that did me in was the Ascent of Man chart. I had a hard time with the Ascent of Man chart and all the Pithecuses and what not, but it, it it was a neat class if you wanted to say things like Pleistocene and Australopithecus, and you could really sound, you know, like you really knew something and what not. But one of the one of the Pithecuses in the Ascent of Man chart, I found out later, was made from one tooth, and I went, what, what? What do you mean you took one tooth and stuck stuck a hole? Pithecus together there, you know, and I found out later, and this is documented, you can document this this yourself, you don't have to believe me, but it was made from made from an extinct pig's tooth. You know, they dug up a pig and that that tooth happened to match and that pretty much Right, okay. I, I get where you're going. I mean, Doctor Bergosian, I mean you don't pretend that you're an expert in the the uh, fossil record, right? 
No, the more I know about, the older I get, the more I realize that I'm an expert and less and less. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, he's kind of asking you to, to kind of defend the, you know, pop culture yeah. references yeah, about the fossil it's, record. It's, and the... You know, people do that. It's, it's, you know, Darwin's, I think his second book was The Descent of Man, and it's a take on that. Yeah, I've right. heard that many times, yeah. I, question for you, though. I mean, evolution is not a, uh, does not explain the origins of life or origins of the universe, right? Uh, evolution does not explain the origin of the universe, no. Right. And so, to some extent, religion or faith is an attempt to explain that. Yeah, it's an unreliable process. It's, it's, a, it's an unreliable process, and it is an, an attempt to explain that, yeah. Yeah, and so it seems to me, I mean, people have a kind of a yearning need, I think, for kind of the cosmic question of what brought us here, why are we here, how did it all begin? Right. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's reason. What's the meaning of life? Why am I here? What's it, my role? In exactly. This? It yeah. goes to all of those questions, but I think they kind of start with how did it all begin, right? Because that answer, depending on what that answer is, kind of takes you down some of those other paths. And it seems to me science can't really answer the how did it all begin question, or at least it has not yet. And evolution, even if you know we just there was a big bang that started everything. There still had to be something that went bang, and so what created that or you what read, out of that you start? Should read, you should read Krauss's Why There's Something and Not Nothing or any of Victor Stanger's work who d vehemently disagrees with that. But I, I want to tease two things out that you said and that kind of an emerging theme that came from your callers. Mm -hmm. This I One is the idea that there's a first mover, as Aristotle calls yeah. it, or a god, and, and the other is evolution. It could... These things aren't naturally wedded together. So, so often people want to believe in God or have beliefs in God from their particular faith tradition, mm -hmm. and then they discharge those kind of belief urges onto things in the natural world, phenomena that are easily explained or relatively easily explained in the case of evolution. Mm -hmm. The answer to your question, do I know how the universe how we all got here? No, I, I don't know. It could be an illegitimate question to begin with. In other words, maybe it was always here. Right. I can't. I, I mean, can't that's answer one that question. But here's one thing: we should proportion our beliefs to the evidence. Mm -hmm. And so, because science at this point can't explain, and some people actually think they can explain it, but I am not qualified to make those sorts yeah. of massive cosmological judgments. Because science can't explain these things, that doesn't mean that an alternative faith-based hypothesis is the way to think about it. In fact, it's absolutely the not, not the way to think about it. We need to proportion our beliefs to the evidence. And if we don't have enough evidence for a particular belief, well, then just say we don't know. Yeah. It, it's not it's not a shame to say that, that there are things that you don't know. Let's go one more call, and then we'll cut you off. You're great. Let's go to Tony in Portland. You're going to be the last caller with Dr. Bogosian, although a lot of other folks who are still on the line, we can continue the discussion even without them. So, Tony, go ahead. Actually, I was going to ask the question of uh, where did everything kind of come from? Like, <laughs> you guys just touched it just as I was listening. Is, you know, if there's the big bang, what went bang? Yeah. That, that was just kind of my challenge to the whole greater designer or all that kind of stuff. Like, I'm definitely not one to, hey, I don't believe that, so it's not a true thing. I believe everybody has a right to do what they believe. But yeah, I, I, ha I, have to pa I have to ask you to pause right there. This isn't about somebody's right to believe. Anybody has a right to believe anything that they want to believe. This is about yeah. the truth or falsity of a belief. And I also want to say in reference to the other caller, it's not only about the truth or falsity of belief, it's about how these things, we live in communities, you know, so how these things affect us. How, what, are the be what are better ways to make decisions about things? So it's not about one's right to believe, although in my case it seems to be about one's right to speak increasingly. <laughs> That's right. But it's about the truth or falsity of the beliefs one holds. Yep. That is, whether or not the beliefs that I have actually latch on to reality in some meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And what are the tools that we can give people to help them to distinguish reality from make-believe land? Fair yeah, enough. Okay. I understand. Well said. And I, uh, I think that's a great place to end the end the segment. Dr. Bogosian, thanks for coming. And it's a, once more, plug your speech on Friday night or your presentation on Friday night. Thank you. So I really appreciate it. I appreciated the civility of your callers once again showing that we really can have mature discussions about these things. Absolutely. So my, you can go to my Philosophy News podcast and get much more detail. Hopefully I'll be 
being a, be able to stay around after my talk. There will be an extensive question and answer period, so if you asked a question today and I couldn't get to it, hopefully we'll be able to get to it Friday night, 7 p.m., Hoffman Hall. It's been a true pleasure, and I really genuinely appreciate everyone's support and the support of my academic freedom to talk about things that are important to me. So thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. That was Dr. Peter Grigosian, Portland State University, Friday night. I'm going to go there, and uh, I think you should too. Okay, we're late for a break. We'll be back to your phone calls on the other side. I'm Rob Kramer. You've got the Lars Larson Show. Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. Back to our regular programming, but I have to say that was one of the most interesting hour pluses of uh, right-wing talk radio I've heard in a long time. It was great conversation. The phones were lit up, and uh, it was unusually highbrow and intellectual. It was uh, really something. 